Okay, you cheer, Mo. Can you, um, everybody, can you hear me in the uh, chat room? Just let me know in the chat room if you can hear. Want to make sure you can hear and see clearly. Yes. And we're just waiting for a few few people to come in before we get started. Okay, so just give me a second. I just want to give people a couple of minutes. And I also want to check to make sure uh, a few people trying to get in from Instagram and so forth. So it's 703 now, we'll start like in a couple of minutes. And I'll put this, um, I'll put the link in the chat room. Okay, so that's that's the well hold on one second. Okay, so that's the link in the chat room right there. Which was coming through. And of course, if you have any questions, um, you can post them in the chat room now. And we're just gonna go through some specifics with regard to the trip. Okay, so your GMO greetings, yet I say we thank you everyone for joining in with this live. We just wanted to go over some details about our upcoming study tour to Kemet and Kanit, which is Egypt and Nubia. It's going to be um, May 24th through June 2nd. For those who don't know, I am Ojirafo Kwesi Radnam Bata Akan, Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America, Akwamu Mine and Marukati Bumu, the Akwamu Nation in North America within Ojira mind, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people in the Western hemisphere. Also founded Hudu Jase Dine, the hearth shrine of Akan ancestral religion in North America and so forth. 
So um, for those who are unaware, we've published to date, i uh, published 31 books. We have some more books coming out this year. We have 30 online courses dealing with various aspects of Afurakani, Afurakani to African ancestral religion, culture, nation building and so forth, restoration. So this particular tour, this study tour that we're calling Arikat, dealing with the cosmology of creation. This is our first study tour to commit, um, you know, taking a group of people. This is the first one. And we wanted to do it around this time, you know, the end of the spring cycle, the Kepri, Kepri to spring cycle, um, a couple of weeks before the summer solstice. So May 24th through June 2nd. Now, hold on one second. I want to make sure people can get into the chat. All right. And I'm just, I need to check real quick to make sure people were not trying to get in. All right. Okay, so here's our page. We created a specific page for the information for the trip. So we say here, you'll see um, the imagery here of the, the great Ba, the ram, um, who is actually the animal totem of Banim Jedet, the great ram, of master of the north, master of the Jed pillar and so forth. His wife is Hat Mehit. And you see her with the fish. She's the foremost of the fish and so forth, a sacred spiritual divinity of the lagoons, uh, collections of water that are fertile and so forth. And this is the image of Banab Jedet as a divinity, ram-headed divinity. This is the image of the divinity Hat Mehit. They are husband and wife in the city of Jejedu in Northern Kemet, which the whites in our screen called Mindy's and so forth. Um, but this is the animal totem. So Ari Kat, Ari means to make or to do. The term Ari also means I, but then Kat, um, the term Ka means soul for males, Kat for females and Kaet for females, but it also means your divine function. It means labor, things that you, um, your function that you execute in the world, quote unquote, destiny or life purpose or life focus, but it's your divine function. So the arikat in this, cos in this context is dealing with, with the functions of the divinities within creation, how they are made to function and how they make the universe function. So as we say, cosmologically, the great mother is Amen and the great the great brothers Aminet and the great fathers Amen. Together they are the two divine halves of the great divine whole, which we call the supreme being. And the children of Aminet and Amen are the deities, the Ntoru, Ntoru two, the forces in nature. They're called Abosom and Akan and Orisha and Yoruba, uh, Vodou and Eve, Arusi and Ibo and so forth, the forces in nature. They are the children of the supreme being. They are the organs within the great divine body of the supreme being. So they make the entire creation function, just like the organs in your body are children of you, the great body and so forth. You are the great being and your body gives birth to smaller bodies that regulate order within you, the great body. These smaller beings or bodies are your organs and glands and they regulate order and distribute you know, energy and so forth throughout your system in a harmonious fashion. These are the quote unquote divinities, the children of the great being and so forth. And then they give birth to smaller beings, which are cells. And those cells within the scheme of creation are us, plant life, animal life, mineral life, and Afurakani, Afurakani to African black human life, and Afurakani, Afurakani, African black human life only. So we are cells within the great divine body of the supreme being. Cells are children of the organs first, but then they're children of the great body. Um, in general, children of the organs in particular and glands in particular, but children of the great body in general, just like we are children of our parent, Abosom, parent, Orisha, parent, Vodou, parent, 
divine organs within the great divine body, but as cells within those great organs, we're also cells within the great divine body at the same time. So Aminet and Amen are our great mother and great father. They are called Nyame Wa and Nyame Nyakan tradition. Now, we're gonna be focused on the cosmology of creation because we'll be visiting different sites. So when you look at the page, we say the manner in which the Ntortu, Ntoru, the goddesses and gods, divine spirit forces in creation is reflected um, in the manner in which we fashion our spiritual selves as Afurakani, Afurakaiti, African black people on every level, individual, family, clan, and community. Just like your organs and glands regulate order in the body, when we align with the forces in nature that regulate order and creation, we can take from that blueprint, that divine alignment and regulate order in our lives, individually, as far as our physical health, in the family with regard to a properly structured family. You see Badnev Jedet here, the ram-headed divinity and Hat Mehit, and they have the child Heru Pakart, that's a divine family, you know, father, mother, and child, and so forth. You have Osar, Aset, and Heru. You have Ptah, Sekmet, and Nefertem. You have various um, Kunwimu, um, Satet, and Anuket. Um, you have various tri triads of divinities and so forth, families of divinities. The way they operate, when you look in the cosmology as well as dealing with them directly through ritual and so forth, through spirit possession and communication, you see how they function in creation and within the shrines of your body, how these forces in creation operate within you, how their energy empowers different organs and systems within your body and so forth to bring health and balance and rejuvenation to you and so forth. When we follow the plan or the structure of the divinities, that divine plan, that order that they lay out and they operate through, when we take that order, align with that order, then apply it to every aspect of our lives, that we order our lives after the order of creation. So we have civilizations, a civilized society, only Afurakani, Afurakani people have been able to establish civilizations. A civilization is a social order rooted in the divine order of creation. The whites and their offspring have societies where people come together and, and do things, but they don't have civilization because they can not align with the forces in nature through spirit possession and spirit communication, and then take that energy and realign the lives of the people with that. They are incapable of communicating with or being possessed by the Abosom, the Orisha, the Bodu, and so forth. So they have no capacity to align with the forces of divine order and bring that integration. Only Afurakani, Afurakani people can do that. And so we are the only ones who have established civilization and that is our culture, our way of life, to incorporate divine law, um, incorporate divine order through divine law and restore divine balance, restore order when imbalance occurs through divine kaet, which is the ancient kamet and kameti term, kanisi term for divine hate. Love and hate or law, love and hate are the expansive and contractive poles of divine order. You incorporate what you need in order to function harmoniously in the world, like breathing or consuming, and then you expel or you repel or you reject or you hate or repulse that which you do not need, which would otherwise cause disease. You incorporate food, but you eliminate toxins, waste. You incorporate oxygen and so forth, but you eliminate or you expel or you exhale carbon dioxide and other you know, toxins that would otherwise, if they remained in your system, lead to your disease and, and ultimately death. So we incorporate what we need and we reject what we don't need. We accept what we need and we repel what we don't need. So that's expansion and contraction. So, um, so this is what we're saying here, the manner in which, which the divinities, the forces in nature, the ntorotu, ntoru, the divine spirit forces in nature, fashion creation, the way they fashion creation is reflected in the manner in which we fashion our spiritual selves as Afurakani, Afurakani people, black people on every level. So we do that individually, family, clan, and community. 
this is foundational for Amanie, which we use that term for nationism, nation building, I might insist you, nation building, restoration. We talk about Pan-Africanism, Black nationalism, different forms of approaches to liberation. We must be grounded in our ancestral culture because that means we're grounded in divine order. That means we can move into a situation where there is a chaotic situation culturally, socially, economically, politically, and have the best means by which we can restore order to that social, political, economic, cultural situation. We have not been able to do that yet because we're approaching nation building or nationalism from a Eurocentric perspective. When your nationism or your nation building is rooted in your ancestral culture, that includes your ancestral religion, then it's rooted in divine order. So you can bring order to disordered situations. That's the key and that's what we've always done. We've strayed away from that. And this is why over the past hundred years, you haven't seen any movement with regard to our liberation, our independence and our sovereignty and our security in our sovereignty to this point. But we're moving in a different direction, but the real direction, the original direction. And this is part of that process. So we say, this is when we are grounded in our ancestral religion under the guidance of our akutu aku, our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. There is no understanding of the value of life without a clear understanding of arikat, the work of creation. Ari means to create, to make, to do, and kat means that divine function, that work, that labor, as we say, your divine function, your life focus, your life purpose, and so forth. But the arikat is the work of creation, cosmology. So, what we will focus on in this, on this trip, when we go to these different sites, is the cosmology that is displayed and, and demonstrated um, throughout these sites. So when you see here, first of all, the trip, $3,000 that includes round trip airfare from JFK International Airport in New York, so you make your way to New York, but we're flying. It's a direct flight. There's no layovers and so forth. A direct flight from Egypt Air on the Egypt Air airline directly from JFK to um, um, Kemet. It's like an 11 hour flight. Um, so round trip airfare is included in our price. Now, 13 individual sites in 12 different cities, going from Northern Kemet all the way through, and we'll go through each city, all the way through to Southern Kemet and into Kanit, into Nubia, include, which is where Abu Simbel, you see this the image here on the side, that is in Abu Simbel, that is in Kanit, Nubia, and so forth. And we'll also be visiting a Nubian village, which we will have to get on a boat ferry us across the river and so forth to get to the Nubian village um, south of Kemet. So 13 individual sites within 12 different cities, up and down the river, the entire length of the country and so forth. Five-star crews that will be part of it. Um, two luxurious five-star hotels. We will also have special access to a recently discovered or uncovered tomb is not yet open to the public. They're still doing archeological excavations on that particular tomb, but because of the people I connected with when I went to Kemet, um, um, when, I, when I went myself, I took a solo trip to Kemet and Kanit, Egypt and Nubia myself, the people I connected with, they have connections and so forth. So we'll be able to visit this excavation site that's not yet open to the public. So, and you have, vegetarian and vegan meal options. So first let's go over some of the, in general, the itinerary. And these are some of the images from when I was in Kemet, this is the temple of Het Heru and Dendera and so forth, standing before one of our pillars. This is in Abu Simbel in Kanid, Nubia. This is the island where the Philae Temple, the Temple of Aset in the region of Philae, one of the islands just south of Kemet and so forth. 
in between Hanid and Kemet, in between Nubia and Egypt and so forth. This is the temple of hot shep suits. So we'll be visiting the Meru, meaning the pyramids of Giza, the Great Pyramid and so forth, as well as the two um, um, Khufu and Kafra and Men Kara and so forth, those pyramids, Sakra and Dashur, the necropolis there. We also have the special access to the new tomb excavation site in that region. There's the uh, museum in Cairo, over 120,000 artifacts. Now, when I was there, they were moving, they built a brand new space, a, a much huge, larger space and so forth. And they were moving all of the artifacts from the original museum to that new one. They've completed that process already, but this is the large museum. It's, you know, spent a significant number of hours in that museum going all the way through and there are over 120,000 artifacts, statues, you know, papyri, um, the mummified bodies of, you know, certain kings and queen mothers and so forth, a number of different artifacts and so forth. It takes hours to go through and see all these various things. So that's, that's a major part of the trip. The Temple of Aset in Philae, that's this image right here. The temples of Ramesu and Nefertari in Abu Simbel, Kanid Nubia, which is this image here on, on the side. Um, the Sobek or Crocodile Temple. Well, first, uh, the Nubian village near Abu, which is Elephant Elephantine Island in Aswan in Nubia. So when you get to the southern border of Kemet and the dividing line between Kemet and Kanit, between Egypt and Nubia, um, you know, you're at different cataracts of the Nile, the Hapi River and so forth. But there are Nubian villages where the Nubians are living and so forth and they have their own arts and crafts and different things and people visit the Nubian villages and so forth. We'll have a boat where we're ferried across the river so we can go into the Nubian villages and connect with the people and you know um, see their culture and so forth. Some of them have crocodiles, baby crocodiles that they have, that they raise in their homes until they're big enough to release into the water. So you'll see that they have, you know, a cage and they'll have a crocodile in their living room and so forth. Just like people have, you know, pets, you know, here, you have cats and dogs and so forth. Some people have snakes in their home. They have crocodiles in their living room. So, but that goes back to ancient, you know, Kanid and Kemet, you'll see that we have, um, you see these images of children standing on crocodiles and so forth. That is not, you know, symbolic. That's a reality. The Temple of Heru in Edfu, which is also called Jeba. Uh, the Temple of Seti in Abju, which is called Abydos. The Temple of Hetheru in Dendera, where you find the original zodiac and so forth. The Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut. And this is that temple right here, um, the Valley of the Kings, where you see the, you know, going to the tombs and so forth of various kings. And then, of course, the Temple of Amen, Amenet, and Mut, and Apet Asut, and Apet Reset, which is quote unquote Luxor and Karnak. So these are the different 13 sites within the different 12 cities that we will be visiting throughout this trip. Now, let's look at the itinerary real quick. Hold on a second. Okay, so this is just a brief uh, itinerary, eight days, seven nights, and so forth. And this is the itinerary that was sent to us uh, by the tour guide and so forth, so the way it will work for us. And when you go to these 
Um, hold on a second. When you go to these, when you see people touring and doing tours in ancient Kemet, what you will find is that um, certain areas you have to have a licensed tour guide in order to enter certain temples and things like that, and have access to certain things, so forth and so forth. So you have a licensed tour guide. Um, very often what they'll do is they'll talk about the history of the temple, the origins of the temple, and give you, you know, basic things about, you know, when it was built, um, who built it, um, you know, and certain trivia and so forth. They will talk about those kinds of things. Hold on a second. I'm just checking the chat room real quick. Okay. I, I'm, I'm gonna get to that question real, just in a second. Um, so what, what's different about ours is we will, you know, the tour guides will talk about, you know, the, the time the temple was built, you know, a number of different things about the temple or, or the site or the tomb and things like that, and who's in the tomb and so forth. So you get that basic information, but then we want to focus on the cosmology as manifest through the deities and, the, you know, um, inscriptions in these temples and tombs and papyri and so forth. So we have an understanding of these sacred sites that we are in. Now, some of these things we've gone over, we have 30 online courses, um, a couple of them are cut part one and part two. If you haven't already taken those courses, we have those in archives. So those are both six week courses. Part one is a six week course. Part two is a six week course. Um, six week courses are $15. So you can um, purchase that and have access to those. You know, each, each week is like a two hour presentation going into detail about different um, divinities in different parts of Kemet. Part 102 that we just finished a few weeks back we dealt with the triad. So we talked about Osara, Set, and Heru in one week. We talked about Ptah, Sekhmet, and Nefertim in one week. We talked about, um, um, who else? Uh, Kanum, or Kunwimu, Satet, and Anuket. You know, diff the different triadic families and what their cosmological function is, Banamjedet, Hatmehit, Heru Picard, and so forth. We did Mentu, Tananet, and Heru Picard. So we, we talked about these different triads. Part one, we talked about cosmology of, you know, uh, the creation of counts of different regions of Kemet and so forth, whether you're talking about Kim and Nu, so-called Hermopolis, um, and the Agdawad, or the eight divinities, the Kim and Nu, eight divinities and so forth, or Anu, so-called Heliopolis, the sacred sanctuary of Ra and Ra and Atim and Atimet and so forth, um, the sacred sanctuary of Menefer, the so-called Shabaka text, the cosmology, of Ptah and so forth, um, Apet Aset and Apet Reset, which is so-called Karnak and Luxor, the sacred cosmology of Amen and Amenet and Mood and so forth. So we dealt with that in part one, these different phases of the creation, unfolding of creation. Um, in part two, we dealt with these triadic families. So you'll, you'll get a primer on that when you take the courses and that includes some of the information in our books. And so when we go on the trip, you'll be aware, but we'll go into some more detail because you'll be right there in the temple where our ancestresses and ancestors were dwelt, dwelled and, and functioned and engaged in ritual and so forth and policy and you know politics and so forth, but also the spirits of our ancestresses and ancestors. When we come to these places, they come as well. Now the White Snow Offspring can walk through temples all day long but no ancestral spirit is gonna show up because they showed up at the temple. These Nsamampo or ancestresses and ancestors are connected to us by spirit genetic connections, spirit genetic blood circles and so forth. So when we come to these temples, then those spirits come to the temples with us. When we come to these tombs, the spirits come to the tombs and so forth. So you'll have a ritual experience as well as a true historical experience. And yes, we will be sending out the itinerary to everybody. When you, when you, um, you know, when you register, we're gonna um, 
give you the modified version. This, this is just a basic version, but we'll give you actually a more detailed version of this itinerary. So, as we said, so it's May 24th through June 2nd, but we're leaving May 24th. It's an 11 hour flight. So we'll arrive um, on the morning of May 25th. That is Awukuda or Wednesday. So we get to the Cairo airport. They have a representative to meet us and so forth. We're going to the museum in Cairo. Hold on a second. Okay. Over 120,000 pieces of, you know, history, true story, and so forth. So um, that includes the Tut Ank Amen collection. Then we have lunch and transfer to the hotel overnight. And in fact, when I went up, the first thing we did, so, so once you fly in and get there in the morning, you have to check in, you have to get your visa. The difference with Kemet is, for example, the difference between Kemet, Kemet or countries like Ghana and Nigeria, you already have your passport. If you don't have your passport, you need to apply for that. And we suggest you do the expedited service because some normally expedited, you know, passports take, you know, six to eight weeks and so forth. But because of the whole COVID issue, some of these things were behind and it was taking them months to get passports back and so forth. So you want to get the passports right away. Now, there are some agencies you can pay extra money and they'll get you your passport, you know, uh, you know, within a few days and so forth. That just depends on you. But you want to get your passport as soon as possible and expedite that service if you don't already have. It. So you need a passport, of course, to get into the country. But in addition to that, there are visas, a visa that you need. Countries like Ghana, Nigeria, and others, you have to apply for your visa and you must have your visa. When you enter the country, you have to have it ahead of time before you travel. In Kemet, you don't have to do that. In Kemet, once you get to the airport, you can purchase your tourist visa at the airport so you don't have to worry about that. It used to be $25. I think they just, just like a couple of months ago, they decided to you know, change the price to $30. So it's $30 price, but that is included in the cost of the trip. So you don't have to pay that. Once we get to the airport, um, you know, we will pay the fee and so forth because you've already paid. So I'll just pay the fee and everybody will, you know, it's basically just a, a document that you fill out and they stamp it. And that's your tourist visa for this, you know, um, period. And that only takes a few minutes and then you have your visa. So, and that's what I did when I went. We did that, went to the hotel and then went to the museum in Cairo. I spent some hours in that museum. It's a huge museum. And the, even the one that I went to was a huge museum. That was the old museum, but they just finished building a much bigger space. And as I said, they moved the uh, artifacts there. So it's a, you know, it'll take hours to go through all that information. We will, you know, the tour guide will give you basic, you know, things about different major pieces, but then we'll have time after that to just, you know, go and walk through the museum and see the different, you know, mummified ancestresses and ancestors, papyri, um, you know, colossal statues and so forth, smaller statues, a number of different things you will find in the museum. And that's, you know, gonna be a great, you know, introduction. So next day, we'll be going to first to the Dashur pyramids. It's an ancient necropolis, so like the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid and so forth. Um, that's right there. And in fact, let me pull up an image of that real quick so you can see it. Okay, so as I said, about 40 kilometers southwest of Cairo. 
This is one of the pyramids, the red pyramid and so forth. And then you also have the bent pyramid, the red pyramid. So that's the sacred necropolis, city of the deceased and so forth in that region. That's the first place we're gonna go. And then the next place is the Royal Necropolis and Sakara. We will see the Step Pyramid, which is one of the first quote unquote true pyramids and so forth. They build it, build it Mastaba by Mastaba in a step fashion, one of the earlier large pyramids and so forth. Now, as you see here is first pyramid built by the king, Jasseru. Sometimes they will call him Zoser about 2800 quote unquote BCE, about 4,800 years ago. And in this region, we'll have the opportunity, as we said earlier, to join the digging team while excavating in one of the newly discovered sites. So, you know, when they're excavating and then they uncover something they never saw before, every year you'll see that, and sometimes we post these articles where they come across a tomb they never came in contact before just a couple of years ago. They uncovered a tomb of a noble that was 4,000 years old and the paintings and everything was still very vibrant. Of course, he's dark brown and so forth. But it was one of those tombs that was um, uncovered, been under the sand for 4,000 years. And they just uncovered it, just stumbled upon it and so forth, you know, excavated the site. And every year they find, you know, come across new places that have been, you know, hidden by the sand for a thousand years or more. So one of these places they recently uncovered once again, it's not yet open to the public, but we have some special access. We paid for the special access, but we'll have special access because the person I'm connected with is connected with the team that's dealing with that. And he was able to get us, you know, some access. So. So um, the tour with the Giza pyramids, the Great Pyramid of Giza and so forth, as well as the two lesser pyramids of Giza and so forth um, will be there. You can go inside a portion of the Great Pyramid, different things. Um, so that's on the second day. The third day, well, before the, so, so once you go to the pyramids of Giza and so forth, you see the Shesepina, which is the Sphinx and so forth as well. Um, after we go through that, and that's you know most of the day, near the end of the day, that's in Northern Kemet. And then we're gonna fly down from Cairo. We're gonna fly all the way down to Nubia. What you will notice in Cairo, in Giza and so forth, especially just driving through the streets and so forth, you will see that in Northern Kemet, there are a lot more Arabs and so forth. But then when we get on that flight and fly down to Aswan, to Nubia, even going into the airport, you start seeing a lot more black people. You see black people, you know, in, in the population in Northern Kemet as well, but it's more dominated by Arabs. But once you get into Southern Kemet, you start seeing, oh, these black people have been here the entire time. These are the ancient Kemeti people and Kaniti people, the Egyptians and Nubians and so forth. They are descendants of the original people who still remained in that area. Of course, some of us left that area and went to West and Central and South, Afuraka, Afraka, Africa. And then some of us were taken from those places and brought here to North America. But some of the people stayed, they remained, and you will see those, those people. And the ones who are um, aware, they look at us the same as they see themselves. Now you have some that are Arabized and things like that, but the ones who are aware, they see black people from America as, you know, as their people. So, so we will fly down to Aswan, check into the hotel and so forth. So then the third day, when you're at Aswan, that's like the dividing line between Kemet and Kani, between Egypt and Nubia. That next morning we get up, you know, have breakfast and so forth, and we'll take a little short road trip. Um, to Abu Simbel first, the great temple of Ramesu II and his wife, Queen Mother Nefertari. And let's just uh, 
image of that real quick. Okay. So this is the great temple of Ramesu II in Khanit, the Nubian Abu Simbel will be visiting that temple, you know, entering into the temple and so forth. That's at nighttime. And then there's also the temple right next to that. Let's pull that up real quick. And this right next to Ramesu II's temple, just right, right next to it, is the temple of his wife, Queen Mother Nefertari. And we will be visiting that temple. So again, the tour guide will show us, you know, give the basic information about how things were built and what time they were built and all of that kind of thing. Um, and then you will have time, we will have time to enter into the temple and spend some time within the temples. Of course, you can take pictures in some, some temples and tombs, they don't allow you to use video. Some of them, they only allow you to take pictures. Um, some of them will allow video, but then you have to pay extra to use the video. So it just depends, but we'll be able to spend some time. One of the reasons I want to go at this particular time of the year is because it's not as crowded during this time of the year. Um, if you go in, you know, in the winter time when people are trying to get away from, you know, the cold and so forth, and around quote unquote Christmas time and Easter, these different big holidays, that's when it's very, you know, it's a lot of people visiting. But once it starts getting very hot in ancient Kemet, um, you know, May, June, July, that's when tourism is very low because it's super hot and it gets very hot in July and August and so forth. Um, like when I went in July, it was like, in, you know, like 110 degrees every day and so forth. Uh, there's no cloud cover. So, um, but it's, you know, it's dry heat, it's bearable, but still that's when tourism is lower and we're going around the end of May into June. So that's when that hot period begins, which is good though, because tourism is lower. Many of the temples that I was into and tombs I, was, I, I went to and so forth, there were times where I was the only person in there. I had you know, time to be in there by myself, or you might see one or two other people walk by and so forth. But we had a, it wasn't you know, a large crowds of people moving through the temples. I had time to you know, spend and you know, connect with the Insamanfo, connect with the Abosom, connected to these sites. So going at this particular time, May 24th through June 2nd, when the you know heat begins, it becomes very intense in July, but this is right around the time where it starts getting hot. And most of the Akshiwadi for the Whites and Arrow Stream Spirits of Disorder don't want to be in commit when it's super hot. But that's good for us because we have more time to spend. It's one thing to know about the true story of the temples, which is good information. Then we get into the cosmology of the divinities that we see in the temples and so forth and tombs. But then to spend some time, you know energetic wise within these sacred spaces that's that's the key now so we'll go there i will symbol first then we'll come up to the temple of philae that's the temple of all set in philae second so show you that one. And that's the temple that we have on the flyer. And once again, when you're in southern, you know, the borderline between, you know, Kemet and Kani, and you have the islands 
in the water right between the you know borderline and so forth of the two countries. This is where the sacred temple of Philae is. It's called Pilaka, Pilaka or Paraka in you know the Coptic dialect and so forth. The sacred temple of Aset. This is the temple that was the final temple that was closed in the so-called sixth century AD. So it was the last outpost, official outpost of the ancestral religion at that point. The Greeks had already invaded, but then the Romans took over from the Greeks in around 50 so-called BCE and so forth. And by the time you get into the 500s AD, so-called AD, um, this was the last official sanctuary of the ancestral religion, the final outpost and so forth. And under the edict of Justinian, they ordered that temple closed. But right after that, what is called the plague of Justinian hit and it sunk, you know, millions of people died all throughout Europe and so forth. That population shrunk because of the plague, just like the uh, so-called Black Death, the bubonic plague in Europe in the so-called 1300s within five years between 50 and 75% of the entire population died, millions of people dying, you know, every year and so forth. The same thing happened um, like 700 plus years before that, when Justinian, the Emperor Justinian ordered the last temple of Aset, the temple of Aset, which was the last, you know, temple of ancestral religion, official temple in Kemet functioning, op operating, you know, out in the open, of course, people practicing the religion, you know, individually, you know, on their own in their homes and so forth. The last official operating temple being ordered to be closed. Right after that, the plague of Justinian hit and it wiped out Europe and they sunk into the quote unquote dark ages for the next 700 years. So, but this is the temple we'll be at, a sacred um, sanctuary, even within this temple. I had a chance to spend some time in that temple where I was the only person in the temple for a while. So, okay, so when, when we originally, when we fly to from Cairo to Abu Simbel um, that evening, and then we check in and so forth, and we get on the Nile cruise, we visit Abu Simbel on a road trip, but then we get on the cruise and we start cruising up the river. As you cruise up the river, there are two ways, of course, to travel through the Met. You can either get on a cruise and travel from south to north, or you can take a road trip and move in the same space. Now, the road trips take a little bit longer. Um, the cruises are, you know, quicker and so forth. So we decided for this portion of the trip, we can sail instead of driving. When I went, we spent more of the time driving. So we were driving, you know, long distances and so forth. But here we'll be on the cruise. We'll go from city to city. The cruise will stop. One of the next stops after the Temple of Philae, um, as well as Elephantine will be there, um, is Kom Ombo which, and Etfu. So there's a Temple of Sobek and um, Sobek and Neat in Kom Ombo. And let's pull that up so you can see it. Okay. So this is that sacred symbol of Komombo. Sobek is the crocodile divinity. And in every tradition, you know, that sacred crocodile is an animal totem for that divinity and so forth. And Bodun is Akjakpa and so forth. And Akan is Odinchim, the crocodile and so forth. Sacred um, animal totem for that divinity and so forth. But that's the temple we'll be visiting. And there is also, so those are some of the, you know, the reliefs that we'll see taking the energy of the temple. But there's also the museum.
in this particular museum. They have mummified crocodiles, and there are a number of other, you know, things that you'll see in the museum. But that's one of those. Uh, this is more, you know, imagery from the temple and so forth. But you'll see not only sculptures of crocodiles, but actual, you know, mummified crocodiles. And that'll be, that's interesting because, you know, that is an animal totem in different clans within our various cultures, whether you're talking about the Zulu, Rakan, Yoruba, Eve, you know, Basa, Fula, Fang, and, and various different groups. And one of one or more of the clans, whether they're matric clans or patrick clans, the crocodile exists as a sacred animal totem that carries that energy of Sobek within um, those clans. So the crocodile totem is connected to all of us. And when we previously, before this part of the trip, when we're at the Nubian village, as I said before, you'll see live crocodiles within the homes of the Nubians. So then you get to the Crocodile Museum and you see these ancient crocodiles that have been mummified. But once again, mummified, as we talk about in our classes, the mummification process is a crystallization process. So when the body is mummified or hardened and so forth, it's actually being transformed into a crystal which makes it a, the greatest magnet for the spirit that used to dwell in that body, the spirit of the animal, or if it's a human being, the spirit of the ancestor, ancestress, but also as a magnet for the abosom, the divinity that governed that individual animal or you know, human being. So you'll feel that energy when you step into the museum. And we have these experiences that the whites in our screen can't, can't have. So then the next temple is the Edfu temple. And that is the sacred temple of Heru Ur, who is also called Heru Bedeti, Heru Bakudet, and so forth. He is called Bena in Yoruba, in Akan, and Ogun in Yoruba, and Ogu in Vodun, and so forth. That is the divinity of iron and war and fire and so forth. That is the sacred temple of Edfu. It's one of the best preserved temples in all of Kemet. So, and even though some of these, um, let's just pull that up real quick. Even though some of these temples that we're talking about right now, like in Komombo, the Sobek temple, or the temple in, in Edfu, as well as Dendera, some of these are late period temples. And this is the sacred temple of Heru and Edfu. Um, they were built, as you will see, they were built on the foundation of earlier temples. So even though some of them, the outer structures were built during the Ptolemaic period, the Greek period and so forth, built by our people, but the Greeks weren't ruling at the time, but they were built on the foundation and even used some of the foundational blocks from earlier temples from 2000 years prior they would use the blocks from earlier temples and use those in the building process. But then even when they excavate regions of the temple space, they will see that there were temples built 2000 years prior on that sacred spot. But then some of those deteriorated or some of the materials were repurposed and used to rebuild the temple during the Ptolemaic time. But the region of that, that portion of the, you know, quote unquote, Hapi or Nile Valley, that sacred space, temples have been built before. It's a vortex of energy, and this is why these temples are built in certain spaces. So it's still a sacred space. You will see the entire story of the legend of Heru Bedeti or Heru Behudet um, on the walls of the temple. So when you see it in books and so forth, and the entire story of Heru Behudet fighting to defend Ra and you know, destroy Set and his followers and so forth. When you see those images in books, those are taken from the walls of the uh, Temple of Heru in Edfu. Okay. So then we'll continue um, going, you know, on the Nile, and then we'll make it up to the Valley of the Kings, the Tem Temple of Hatshepsut, the Colossi of Memnon, and so forth. So.
Let's just show a little image of the Valley of the Kings. So when you go in and you see, come into the space and you will we'll be right here and so forth, each one of those causeways that you see go down. When you go down, that's a tomb of one of the kings. You have Ramesu the ninth, Ramesu the third, Ramesu the sixth, um, Seti, Mer Enpetah, Tutankhamen. And in the Tutankhamen tomb, when you go into that tomb, you go, for example, you go into this space right here. And then you go down, you go into the tomb, you all the pictures you see in the books and so forth of the tomb of Tutankhamen, of course, that's what you'll see. But they actually have Tutankhamen's body in his tomb. So when you go into his tomb, you will see his body. They, that's one of the tombs where they have the body still in the tomb, preserved, and so forth, as opposed to having the mummified body in the museum. And for Tutankhamen, they have his mummified body it's in a glass, you know, of course it's protected and everything, but it's in the glass case. And of course you can take pictures of that, we did that, but it's in the, in that tomb. But, so when you go in the tombs and you see all of the different, you know, the book of the Duat and so forth and the various different texts and so forth along the walls, ceilings and everything else. And this is one of the causeways where you walk by and you go deep down into the tombs. And of course they're underground and you walk down, it's like a ramp going down into the tombs and so forth. You'll see the inscriptions on the walls and so forth. So we'll be there. And before I go further, let me, there are a couple of questions in the chat room. If you have any questions, of course you can post them in the chat room. Okay, question, do you have any thoughts on obtaining travel insurance due to current circumstances? Also, will or are there any specifics dressing due to customs in Kemet? Um, are you able to tell us any more on the tomb or temple that you mentioned, whereas others have not visited? Okay, so for the tomb and temple, it's, it's in the Sakura region. Um, we'll get some details. I'll get some more details from the tour guide, but. It, it is in the Sakura region. So that second day when we go to the Dashur um, complex and the uh, step pyramid, it's in that region. But they're still excavating, so they don't have all the details yet, but we'll, we'll get the names, you know, whoever they have discovered so far, we'll get the names of, you know, um, you know who it is and maybe like a noble and so forth. They just found another tomb of a noble um, just recently. I posted that on, on Facebook and so forth. Um, it may be a tomb of a noble. That they found a tomb also of um, the wife of the Pera. Her name is Nari, but she's the wife of the Pera, the Pharaoh Teti from the Sixth Dynasty. They found his queen, her tomb, which they never found before, just recently. So I, I just recently posted that a couple of days ago. So, but we'll find out. We'll get some more details before. Um, as they find out more information, as they're excavating and digging, um, they'll release some things, but they won't release it. Um, public yet, but because we're going to that space, we'll get some basic information about if this is a noble or you know a prince or a princess or a king or whatever it is. More than likely, well, I can't even say more than likely because it may be you know a king that they never found before, or it may be a noble. We'll we'll just see. Uh, with regard to the insurance, it's not required that you have insurance. I purchased some insurance just in case. You can purchase purchase a you know travel insurance. Usually, um, travel insurance for you know like a, a one time trip for a place like Kemet might be like eighty five dollars or something with like a you know a reputable travel insurance agency. So you can do that. And when you look through like the John Hancock Company and so forth is a popular one. Um, when you look through their policies and so forth for tourist insurance or travel insurance you'll see the things that they cover, but it's usually about $85 to $100 for an average policy to cover your trip. So that means if something happened medically, you know, you're covered, um, including if you need to come back to the United States, but you know, we're not gonna go through that, but you know, I, I, I did that, but it's not required. Some places require that, but 
in Kemet, they don't require travel insurance, but you, you can do that. They are not as, with regard to the dress code, it's not as strict as say like Saudi Arabia or something. There are certain customs that are kind of normalized. For example, when you see people moving in and out the temples and so forth, like the tour guide was telling me, you don't typically see people, you know, wearing tank tops and shorts and so forth, even for the men. It seem, seem, for men, they typically don't see men with their arms out and legs out and so forth. That's just customarily, that's not what they do. Um, so most tourists you see, they won't be dressed like that. They'll usually have on, you know, a t-shirt and some pants, whether they're sweatpants, jogging pants, or, you know, khakis and things like that. Um, we're gonna have a list that we send out for everybody with the kind of things you should bring, including things like, you know, um, an, an adapter for, you know, the outlet because the outlets are different. So you want to have an adapter for your, so when you plug in your, you'll be able to plug in your phone, you plug it through an adapter because the outlets are different. There they have different voltage and so forth. But there are a number of different travel things that you want to, you know, a travel list that you need to pack with you. And we'll include the information that comes directly from the government and uh, tourist sites about you know, the dress code, but it's not a stringent dress code like Saudi Arabia or something like that. Most people just wear, you know, casual clothing. Like a, you know, t-shirt, um, khaki pants and things like that. Okay, just wanted to make sure there were no other questions in the chat. Okay, so the mortuary temple, a pot ship suit. One. Okay, so this is that major temple of hot ship suit carved inside of a mountain. That's different. Okay, so this is that great mortuary temple. And when you go inside, of course, they have the various reliefs and so forth. There's also a chapel a small chapel on the side of the temple specifically dedicated to Het Heru. Um, and once again, that was a, you know, a chapel when I was there, even though there were more people walking around outside with regard to the, you know, temple of Hatshepsut. It was in the afternoon by the time we went, but still, when I went into the chapel of Het Heru, I was able to spend, you know, some time alone. I was the only person in the chapel of the temple of Het Heru within the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut for a while and was able to absorb her to me, her divine energy while I was in her sacred shrine space. So, and you'll see this is the mountain in the background, but the entire temple is carved from within inside that, that mountain. Oh, somebody was saying that the screen didn't change. Okay, are you able to see the image of the temple now? Yes. Well, let me know in the chat room. Yes. So it came back up, all right. So yeah, so that's that's what we're sacred sanctuary of uh, Hatshep Suit, the Queen Mother Hatshep Suit. Um, the Colossi of Memnon is two statues of 
the pair of or the quote unquote pharaoh and so forth, they're kind of damaged, but still two colossal statues and so forth. We continue along um, the river and so forth, and then we get to the temple of uh, Dendera. That's um, where you find the zodiac. Now they have a the circular zodiac was blasted out, and it's in the museum in France. They have a circular zodiac replica that's like the one that was there on the ceiling and so forth. But then they have another version, a rectangular version of zodiac as well. That's the first zodiac, you know, relief in existence. And as we showed in some of our articles. Um, dealing with the zodiac and the original signs of the zodiac and so forth, the original animal totems. Some people try to say that um, astrology and the zodiac and so forth began in quote unquote Babylon. And of course that's not true. So when you look at the text and you look at even in our books, when you look in the Kemet, Hinnah and Toto book, um, when we have one part of the zodiac when we're talking about the Pleiades, the seven sisters, which are the seven Het Heru, and there's seven cows and so forth, plus the bull right next to them, who is their husband. And then you have um, uh, the star Sa, which is called Orion. And you see Osar, who is Osar Sa, Osar in Orion, and the 12 deities who are his attendants. You'll see that's the exact same you know, structure in the sky, the seven Pleiades, the um, bull, which is quote unquote Taurus and so forth. And then Orion with the shield, the four stars of the shield are really the four sons of Heru originally. And then Orion, you see Orion's belt and all that, but you have, that's the sanctuary of Osar. And then the 12 stars around that are his attendants and so forth. That is that portion of the sky. And when you look at the different texts of Kemet, you will see that we've mapped out the sky. So astrology in the true sense began with our people in Nubia and Kemet prior to Babylon prior to soon. So, but that's a great temple dedicated to Het Heru. Once again, it's a late period temple, but it was built on the foundation of an older temple that predated it by a couple of thousand years. So you still feel that ancient energy when you're in that region, in that space, because it's a sacred space. Okay. And also, on the same day, we'll be going to the temple of Seti in Abju, which they call Abydos. One of the distinguishing characteristics of the uh, temple of uh, in Abydos in Abju. is because it was, um, and this, some, some of the pillars inside of the temple and so forth, but because it was, you know, um, the sun was blocked and so forth and because it was remote and it wasn't exposed, some of the areas weren't exposed, because some of the temples, the, the ceilings have been were destroyed and removed and so forth. So when the sunlight hits, you normally see these, pillars and things like this, and this is how they look now. But actually they were all painted. We're so used to seeing them like this because the paint has faded under the sunlight. Sometimes under the sunlight and sometimes under the debris and so forth. Um, but because of the sunlight, things fade. But for example, let's show a inside. So this is an example of image inside of the temple of Abydos. So when you get inside, it's dark inside, but they have lights and so forth inside. But you'll see, this is how normally, you know, the temples look on the inside and the outside. So you see they're all painted. You see the different colors, blue, gold, and everything else. But when the sun hits, you know, paint and so forth over years and so forth, it fades and then you just see it's all one brown color of the stone, but this is how it normally appears. So when you when we go inside the temple of Abdu, um, and there are different sanctuaries for our Sar and our Set and various different divinities and so forth. It's a huge temple, so you have time 
I spent a couple of hours in that temple alone, just taking pictures in that temple and so forth. So um, I have hundreds of pictures and so forth and some video of the various temples, but this is what you will see. Now there are certain parts of the temple where things have been faded, but many of them, it's, it's known for being one of the temples in, inside that's more well-preserved than as far as the colors, the vibrancy of the colors than various other temples and so forth. And very often when we're looking at, you know, images and comet and so forth, we don't always get to see these fully vibrant colors. And then we have an understanding of how the, you know, colors are connected to different deities and what the energies represent and so forth. We'll be covering that when we're going through and visiting. Okay, and then we go back we're still going, so we're going from south to north and we're getting up towards the central region and everything else. And we get to the Apet Reset or the so-called Luxor Temple and the Avenue of Hasheps, um, Hashepinakwas, Sphinxes and so forth. And then the Apet Asut, the Karnak Temple, the Great Temple of Amen, the Amen, Amenet, Mut, and so forth. Very often they just say the temple of Amen. So for example, let me show you. When you typically see that, you'll see temple of Ah, Moon, Karnak. And these are the typical, you know, the images that you see and so forth. These great columns and so forth, you walk through and see. This is from a distance so you can see, oh, hold on one second pop up. Okay, so So you'll see these great columns and so forth. You see the hypostyle hall. You see how small, you know, the people are, of course, this is how large these columns are. And you're walking through, it's like going through a huge forest of, you know, great columns where the different divinities are. When you walk through and you see images of Amen and Amenet and Mut and, you know, Ra and all these different divinities, Alsara, Alset, Tehuti, um, says shot. Let me give you an example real quick of uh, something that we posted on Instagram, just to give an, a sense of, you know, what we will experience when we're there. And why it's important to understand the cosmology. Now, I posted this on Instagram a while back. And for the people who register, I mean, we're gonna, you know, over the next few months, we'll share some information for those who register with regard to some of the, you know, images that we were able to capture when I was there. But this particular image is important. Let me just pull it up. And just give me a second, it's uh, taking a minute to pull up. But if you have any uh, any more questions, we're almost done. So if you have any questions, just let me know in the chat room. Okay. So we just saw the hypo style hall and the temple of Apet Aset. So this is one of those columns in that hall and when you look at the you know columns you'll see so let's go back real quick Oh, 
Okay, so for example, this is a you know a row of Chesepinon sphinxes and so forth, and here's an image of the hall of the columns when you first walk in, depending on what side you walk in from. So when people are walking through, when you're walking through and you see the columns and you see the different divinities and so forth. Now, when we go back, one of them, this is an image from one of the columns when you look up and see the different deities and the cosmology that they're representing. Um, I wanted to find an image of, of course, you're gonna see Amen everywhere. I want to find an image of Amenet. And when I was thinking about trying to find an image, I looked up and there she was. So you have Amen here and you have Amenet here. And we took a number of pictures and on various columns, you will see Amen and Amenet together. The same thing with Ra'et. I wish there are so many columns. I wanted to find out where Ra'et was. And I felt moved to walk to a certain place and I looked up and Ra'et was right over me and I took a picture and video of her and so forth. But um, one, this is why it's important with regard to cosmology. When you're practicing authentic ancestral religion, you're seeking reality, the reality of creation. You attune to Amen as well as Amenet, Inyame as well as Inyamewa. So when you're seeking that balance because you want you know, to attune to the forces in creation, attune to divine order, they will show you where that balance is. If you still have a patriarchal mindset, maybe you came out of Christianity or Islam or five percenters or Moorishism or, or some other nonsense and so forth, but you haven't fully you know, purge that from your system. You have people going to commit, you know, yearly or having tours or, you know, taking people to commit and so forth. And they will walk right into this hall, this hypostyle hall and walk through all of these, you know, you know, columns and so forth. And they'll point out all sar and all set and they'll point out amen and so forth. But when they walk by this column, and there are many other columns. When they see this, they'll say, there goes Amen. And then they'll keep walking. And Amenet, the great mother of creation, is right next to him. And people have been going to these tours for 20 years and never heard the name Amenet one time in all of these years. Because there's something blocking the individual that's still controlled by pseudo religion. And they've imprinted that false, you know, um, those, those false parameters within spirituality, they imprinted that, that came from Christianity, Islam, pseudo metaphysics and everything else. They've imprinted that on their quote unquote practice of comedic tradition. So they're still talking about Amen or Amen Ra is the great God and he's the one God. And he, he's the sole single monotheistic God and all this other nonsense. But Amenet, the great mother creation that we, we are all born of, she's right there but that precludes them, that mindset precludes them from seeing or even paying attention to her. They will look up, see the individual and keep walking. They'll see her statuary and keep walking. Let me show you one other image. And we were able to get a picture of this. So you see this great colossal statue of Amenet. If you were to stand, let me just pull it up real quick. If you were to stand next to this statue, If you were to stand next to this statue, you would probably come up to about right here on the statue. That's how tall the statue is, probably about 20 feet tall or, or more and so forth. Um, this is the great mother Amenet. And then right next to her, you have Amen. Now, when I was there, they were, um, you know, they were uh, working, you know, working on uh, preserving the statue. There was some damage on it. So they were working on the statue. So it was, you know, it was covered and so forth, and it was blocked off from the people. But the tour guide I was with, 
he knew one of the people and they allowed us to go in the back, even though we weren't supposed to go back there. And sometimes they'll do that. And sometimes they'll ask for a little money to do this or whatever. But that um, part was all covered up. There were you know, barriers there. There were signs saying people couldn't go to that region. The guard took us in the back and allowed me to get a picture because I, that was one of the pictures I wanted to get of the great mother Amanet, that colossal statue of her. So they uncovered part of her and so forth. I was able to get a couple of pictures of her. It may be fully restored by the time we go in May, but either way, this is a colossal statue of Amenet. And right next to that is a colossal statue of Amen, Tut Ankh Amen in the form of the male divinity Amen. So you have Amen and Amenet. That same um, picture that we have in the Oba time book and Obedima book, the womanhood book and manhood book, um, that's the image. So how many people who've been going, even if they're Afrocentric, have been going to the temple of Aperasut, so-called Karnak and so forth, all these years and walk right by the statue of the great mother of creation. You're still imbalanced if you're not seeking to find her, ritually, as well as cosmologically, as well as when you go and visit these sacred shrine spaces, there's something inside of you that should make you go, Aminette should make you go and find her if you're in a tomb. What other divinities are people not looking for? People know about Haki, the male divinity of divine, you know, of the river and so forth. But if you're in alignment, then you'll look for Merit. So for example, we have images and of course we have our Hapi Merit retreat coming up next month, but this is Hapi, the male divinity of the river. This is Merit the female divinity of the river. And that's from the temple of Seti and Abju. So you'll see that actual image and so forth. But there are people once again who've been going to Kemet for 10, 20, 30 years. They talk about Hapi and take pictures of Hapi and so forth, the male deity of the river. But Merit, the wife of Hapi, they don't even know she exists. And she's right there. They just walk right by her because something inside of them has been blocked. They're still controlled by a false narrative and they're imprinting that false patriarchal pseudo fake religious narrative on real religion. So they miss her. If you go in the temple of Seti and Abju and you look in one of the entrance ways to one of the chapels of Alsara and so forth, or, or Amen as a matter of fact, you'll see that Hapi and Merit are on the doorways on both sides. You have Merit of the South and Merit of the North, Merit Shema and Merit Met right there on the wall, you can take pictures of them and so forth. You'll see Hapi of the South and Hapi of the North as well, but people will walk right by them because they don't know that they should even be looking for these female divinities. And of course, one of the major divinities that we talked about while I was in the temple of Ramesu the sixth. Let me just go back to Go back to the Facebook page because we posted this image when I was in Kemet, I took this picture as well. And this is one of the reasons why the cosmology is important, why we focus on the cosmology, because we're not doing these things just for, you know, it's just interesting to see, you know, sculptures and deities. We still communicate with these forces in the nature. They still guide every aspect of our lives when we know who they are. And we can identify how they operate within our lives and so forth and how they restore order to our lives when we get in alignment with them. So this is part of our ritual practice. And this is one of the images, let me just pull this up. When I was in the temple of Ramesu the sixth, or sorry, the tomb of Ramesu the sixth, you will see that they have um, the book of the Dua the 12 hours of the night and so forth. And this is one of the images that we have that I took from that. And as you can see here, the sickle and the plant and the uh, papyrus roll and so forth. So that's the male de deity Ma'at. He is the counterpart of the female divinity Ma'at. Now, of course, we've talked about him. We have a six week course on him. He's the counterpart of Ma'at. He's one half of the divine law that undergirds the universe and so forth. There is no creation without 
Ma'a and Ma'at, the male and female force of divine law and balance that force in creation that balances the equinoctial points, the spring equinox, the you know, um, autumn equinox, the balancing points of the year and so forth, the center of balance within your body, the vestibular system within the inner ear, the right and left and so forth, that region where you send your energy to rebalance yourself. Ma'a is the male force of fine law and balance. He's always been in that temple and various other temples. I have images of him and various papyri that you find in the museum in Cairo that we will see and so forth. We go to the 11th hour of the night and you will see that image of Ma'a in various different papyri from various different eras of Kemet. What has precluded these teachers and even quote unquote priests and priestesses, Kemetic and so forth, what has precluded them or prevented them from seeing him and taking note of him and including him in their practice. They don't even know that he exists. They think it's just Ma'at and they'll write books about Ma'at and do presentations about Ma'at and how Ma'at is order and everything else. And she's really law, the expression of order, but, um, but one half of the divine law that undergirds, undergirds creation, they know nothing about because we haven't been engaged, many of our people in authentic religious practice, because if we were Ma'at herself as a divinity, she's called Amma um, Ria in Akan, and he's called Amma Su um, in Akan, but one of her titles is Odu in Yoruba, the female Orisha, Odu and so forth. If you're constantly invoking this female divinity Ma'at, she herself is going to make you include Ma'at and he himself will make himself known as well. You won't be allowed to only talk about Ma'at when you're engaged in ritual practice. He will make you come forward, acknowledge him, and then ritually align with him because that's part of divine law. If you're in a tomb, and even if, if you didn't know the divinity existed, he will make you seek him out so that you can understand. But if you're not really practicing authentic tradition, then you won't even know the divinity exists. So we're talking about balanced representation of culture because when we deal with these actual divinities, this is confirmation of the ritual practices that we engage in on a daily basis in the Hoodoo tradition in North America, the Juju tradition, the Voodoo tradition, the Wanga tradition, the Gangan tradition, the Golan Kisi Gullah Geechee tradition, Grigory tradition and so forth. The various forms of ancestral religious practice that we have preserved in our blood circles. We deal with the forces in nature, which includes Ma'a, Ma'at, Amen, Amenet, Ra and Ra'et, Atem and Atemet, Kepra and Keprit, and so forth, all in balance. So that's why the cosmology is important. Okay. So let's, we're going to wrap it up right now. I just want to get back to the page. So, so they're vegan and vegetarian options throughout the trip and so forth. Most days is, um, you know, two meals are included and then there, you have time to, you know, spend time on your own and, you know, check things out on your own and so forth. We don't wanna control every hour of your day. So we, when we go to the different sites, the tour guide would talk about the you know, history, true story of the temples and when they were building those kinds of things. Other things that are important as far as the chronology, I will talk about the cosmology of the region and then you'll have time to go on your own, take pictures, as well as experience the energy of these sacred sites. So, so as we said, vegan vegetarian meal options are there, five-star cruise. Um, Thirteen individual sites in the twelve cities that we mentioned. Now we have the double occupancy, which is you know, three thousand. Single occupancy, as you know, whenever you have a single occupancy, some people just want a single room, it's a little bit more. Um, and you can choose that. Um, if you have the double occupancy, um, 
you don't have to have a roommate in advance. Um, we'll assign a roommate for you based on compatibility and, and you know, we'll talk to you about that and so forth. Um, so reservations, $300 non-refundable deposit. Um, that, that secures your reservation. So we have some people saying, hey, uh, put me down for our trip. We can't put anybody down until there's a, you know, a deposit. Once the deposit is made, then you're confirmed as far as having reserved the space. And then the final payment, since we're leaving May 24th, we need to have the final payment in around mid-April. <clears throat> the first, and you, you can have your, um, your payment plan, your installment payment plan. There are a couple of ways to do that as you see on the website. You see here when you click on the PayPal button, there's an option for the $300 deposit. There's an option for a full registration if you want to pay it in full and so forth, 50% um, or installment payments, you can installment payment of $300, $400, $500, $600, however you want to do that. Um, so you make the initial deposit and then January, February, March, and April, you can figure out the way you make your payments, but the final payment needs to be in by mid-April and we'll send out you know, notices and so forth. Now, through PayPal, you know, that's one way to pay, of course, um, Cash App as well, but there's also a pay later option for PayPal. They used to call it PayPal credit and so forth, but it's pay later option. And all that is, is when you click through PayPal, there's an option that says, do you wanna pay this over time? So if you charge the entire trip with PayPal, instead of paying the entire amount of 3000, if you're approved for PayPal credits, no different than like, it's like putting the trip on a $3,000 credit card. So you pay for the whole trip and then you send PayPal, you know, you get a bill from PayPal every month and you make payments until it's paid off. And it can be, uh, three months, four months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. I think they go up to 36 months. Um, so you might be paying, you know, $120 for 36 months or however it is. It depends on your approval and how much they approve you for. Some people will be approved for the entire amount. Some people will be approved for half of it and so forth. That just depends. So that is an option, you know, a pay later option. Some people use that option because it's just like putting the whole thing on a credit card. Um, and that way, you know, you can pay over time. Some people will just make payments, have been making payments on a monthly basis until they, you know, well, we have to be finished paying by April because um, we have to secure the hotels and everything. But also um, the first thing we want to do is secure the flights because the closer you get to, you know, the time frame, the flights can be increased by six or $700. It could go from being a flight that's $1,000 to the next thing you know, $1,600. And we don't want to increase the price of the trip. And we say that here on the flyer, as you can see here, airline fares are subject to change. Fares are only guaranteed upon final payment and ticketing. A rise in airline fares may result in a fluctuation of our tour rates. So we have like, we're doing a similar tour with regard to the, the cities that we are going to. Everybody else, when you see a tour to connect, they're going to those same major sites, those same sacred sites. They're going to Giza, they're going to Dashur, they're going to Abu Simbel and Komombo. Now, some people stay mainly in the North and they don't go to Nubia. Um, we definitely have to go to Nubia and we're going to that Nubian village as well. But so we wanted, of course, to include that, going to Philae, going to Komombo, going to Edfu and so forth. Some people, you know, they may take a four or five day trip and they don't go to all those different sites. They may go to eight sites. We're going to 13 sites in 12 cities. Um, some people simply spread it out. Instead of having this eight day, you know, trip, they'll have a 15 day trip and they just spend more time talking and they may spend more time at a place and have more time for people to hang out in a place. But 
what you'll see is sometimes they do that. Sometimes people just want to spend more time in the country, but also the reason why they're able to do that, instead of $3,000 like ours, most of the trips that you see are $3,500 or $4,000 or $4,100. Most of the trips you see going to Quebec are on average are around, around $3,900, $4,000. We wanted to have the best price, yet we're also going to the same places, but we're gonna get some more insight on the cosmology of these places, as well as having the um, option, which is included of, you know, um, the excavation site of the place that's not yet open to the public. So that's an added bonus and so forth. That was a little extra, that, that, but that's included in the price. We paid a little bit more for that. Um, because we wanted to have that experience. But we were able to keep our prices to 3000 because in fact, I hadn't seen any other trip um, going to commit by various different people the past few years, including this year and so forth, that they were able to do it for 3000. They could do it for 3000, but then that cuts into the profit margin. So if they were to do it for 3000, then they wouldn't make the kind of profit, that extra thousand dollar profit, basically. We wanted to keep it as low as possible so that you know more people can access that. We didn't have to spend 15 days, just you know, people spending extra time on a cruise, or they may have a little party, you know, um, things like that. There's certain things that the people who follow our work will see. For example, there, there's going to a trip to um um Alexandria was one of them. You could have went to Alexandria and that's, it's kind of far away. So going on that trip to Alexandria takes hours to get there. The major thing in Alexandria is the library of Alexandria. It's one of the largest libraries in the world. There are thousands of books and everything else. Um, then they have the you know Roman temples and, and things like that. Um, and, and the Roman catacombs and so forth, but it takes hours to get there. And then there's, you know, it takes hours to get back. So if you include Alexandria as part of your itinerary, then that would be a whole day totally for Alexandria. The people who are interested in the work that we do and studied our work and so forth, if we spent a whole day traveling to Alexandria, going to the library, which is, you know, it's impressive because it's a library, but it's not any ancient temples, they didn't necessarily want to go see. Um, Roman catacombs or a mosque, people didn't, the people who follow our work don't want to fly all the way to Quebec and spend time visiting a mosque or visiting a Roman catacomb or just visiting a library. So we didn't include that as part of our trip. We removed that as a day. At first we thought about doing that, but since we saw what, what it was about, there was no need to include that. Now, some people, you go to Quebec at some other time and you want to spend time there, People will do that. They'll go to that trip. They spend like four or five hours going to the library and, you know, the catacombs and the mosque. And then they're like, you know, they promote it as, and then you can, you know, spend time on the beaches in Alexandria. These beaches are beautiful and all of that. Our people are not flying all the way to Quebec just to see some catacombs or mosque and chill on the beach. You could spend that day going to another temple site or a tomb site instead of spending it somewhere else. So we remove things like that. And there are other things and other, you know, activities that people engage in that will expand, you know, expand their eight day tour to a, you know, 14 or 15 day tour. Uh, but then you have an extra thousand dollars that in our, you know, in our assessment is unnecessary. So we wanted to get, keep the price as low as possible, but the only way we can do that, we have to get the flights as soon as possible so, um, so we can keep that rate down. We don't want to pay an extra four or five or $600 for the exact same flight simply because it's getting close to the time. So um, that's the only thing that could possibly fluctuate. So that's why we need to get people to, you decide you're going, register, and we can get the process moving. So you'll see the details there. We have passport and visa information. You need your US passport. As I said, you need to expedite that as soon as possible. Get your passport, pay for the extra, 
uh, expedited service so you can make sure you get it in time. And we'll have more information for that for people registered the visa, as we said, um, for a commit, which is very simple. Once we get to the airport, we have the rep meeting us at the airport, help us go through customs and everything else. He will take us to the visa desk and so forth. I'll simply pay the fee and then, you know, um, you just fill out the document, they stamp it and you have your, your tourist fees. Now, with, with regard to the vaccinations, and I just talked to the tour guide a couple of days ago about this, just to get the updates. Just like it was last year, it's the same thing now. You do not need a vaccination to enter Quebec. Now, there are some countries like Ghana, for example, they just recently instituted this new policy where you have to be vaccinated. They don't have any exemptions and so forth if you want to travel to Ghana. Many of the other countries are not doing that. Um, Kemet is not doing that. Their, their economy, a significant portion of their economy is dependent on tourism. They're not going to implement you know, a vaccination requirement and cut off you know, millions and millions of dollars of tourist dollars because they're implementing a vaccine requirement, which is nonsense. You're outside, it's very hot, you're in the de desert. Even if there was a virus, the virus doesn't survive in the, you know, heat like that. Um, so they, they still have the same policy that, that they've had since the last year. Proof of a negative PCR test, COVID test, 72 hours before the flight. So if you're flying in at you know, um, 10 a.m. from JFK, then 72 hours before that, within that 72 hour period, you have to have a negative PCR test, specifically the PCR test. And many cities, you can get those PCR tests for free, but it needs to be a PCR test to get into commit. And it has to have a QR code on the test. So, and we'll update you on that as well as it gets close and so forth. But that, that's the thing. Coming back to the United States, their policy as it stands, and we check the policy and any changes in the policy, we're checking that weekly. But as it stands right now, in order to get back to the United States, you have to have a negative test within 24 hours of the flight. It used to be 72 hours, but they changed it to 24 recently. So you need to have a um, negative COVID test within 24 hours. Our tour guide has um, worked with the labs and so forth where they are going to come to our hotel and then we can do the test right there and they will give you the swab. And this is the test that I've taken before, not the long swab that you stick all the way up in your nose, but it's a short swab they hand it to you you just put it right inside your nostril yourself, and then you put it in the vial and you give it to them. And the test results are within 12 hours. So they're gonna to come to us. We don't have to go to a lab, you know, wait in line and so forth and get the test and then come back to the lab. That's what I had to do when I was there. I had to go to a lab, get a test. Then the next day we had to go back to the lab to pick up the results of the test. Um, this time we have an arrangement where they're gonna to come to our hotel. They will test us right there. And then we'll have the results and um, within 12 hours and we'll, you know, you can use those results to return to the United States. So, and things are changing rapidly with regard to that. If you look in the news today, you'll see that Israel just announced that the fourth booster that they required their citizens to have was ineffective. They admitted that they made mistakes and so forth. And they're beginning to look at the reality that the vaccine is not actually effective. And what they're gonna end up relying on is herd immunity, meaning most people are in, gonna end up getting the virus just like a lot of people get the flu virus, but you don't need a, a flu test to get on a plane. Eventually it's gonna move in that direction. They're gonna drop these vaccine mandates because they've infected enough people with the vaccine. The people who know and understand that we shouldn't be getting these vaccines, we're not going to get. So all the people that they were able to scare into getting the vaccine, most of those people have already done that. So there's a small percentage of people who said, no, we're never going to get it. No matter what you do, you can threaten our jobs, threaten this, threaten that. We're not getting it. 
So they know they've reached that point. So now they're about to backpedal and so forth. Eventually it's gonna be a thing where this is seen like what, what it really is like flu and these requirements and mask re requirements and vaccination requirements are going to drop. More than likely that'll happen around the spring and they'll come up with some justification for that. They're already laying the groundwork for that with this new article about Israel saying, that, you know, these vaccines are really ineffective. People just get the virus. Most people, 99 plus percent of people who get it, they, you know, overcome it just over the course of days and so forth, just like the flu and so forth. Most people get the flu, they survive the flu. And there's no vaccine requirement to get on a plane if you have the flu and so forth. So and there's no test requirement and eventually that's going to drop. But at this point, you just take a PCR test 72 hours, within 72 hours to fly out to Kemet and we will update everybody. And we already have it taken care of with regard to how we're going to do it um, coming back. Now the PCR, the test is not included as part of the cost of the trip. We're gonna find out how much the test costs, but he was able to get us a better rate. So as time goes forward, we will have all of that information, um, but we'll have a much better rate for a test. And now the United States is not requiring a PCR test to fly back to the United States. They used to require a PCR test, but now they're saying you can use an antigen test. And the reason why that's important, one of the reasons why it's important, you, you could get an at-home antigen test for $30 or $40. Um, you could go to a lab and get an antigen, antigen test for $30 or $40, but the PCR tests were like $175, $150, $200, and so forth. And they used to make you get a PCR test. You had to purchase the, you know, the expensive test. But now they're allowing the antigen tests so it may be like 30 or $40 or something like that. So we're gonna find out how much it's gonna be um, for that test coming back to, from Comet to the United States. That is not covered in the cost, but it's gonna be a small cost. So we will let people know well ahead of, ahead of time. So if it's $40, you just bring an extra $40 with you. Um, we'll purchase the test and you know, we'll do what we need to do. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and End it here. Okay, somebody was saying there was no sound. Okay, were you all, have you all been able to hear at this point? Because I had a couple of messages saying, well, message, one person was saying they could not hear. So just let me know in the chat room. Oh, you've been able to hear, okay. So maybe that was just one, one individual's, okay. Okay, so this, this is, um, we just wanted to you know, go over, put this information out. We're gonna have updates. This might be the best time. Some people will you know, um, use their tax refund and so forth to purchase, you know, fund a portion of the trip and then, uh, you know, make payments um, over the next few months and so forth. But yes, we have January, February, March, and April. This is the time frame we have now. The final payment must be in by April, but the reservation in order to reserve your spot, $300 non-refundable deposit, and we can get that going. You can let people know, of course, of course, our trip is open to Afurakani, Afurakani people, African Black people only, of course. So when you let people know about the trip, um, you know, let them go to the page and so forth, um, see the information. We will post this video on our YouTube page so people can get in a sense of what's taking place. Um, we'll post some more videos soon just to let people know. Um, but yeah, let people know if they've been studying the work or they're interested you know, in the work and so forth, they can go to our website. Of course, they can download our books for free. They can access some of the courses and so forth, but we do have um, we do have some spaces left. We wanted to have about 25 people. We have about half of the spaces left available. So just, you know, you can go to the Adikot Commit page, 
make a deposit and reserve your space. And of course, if you have any questions, just uh, let me know. So again, Yerase, we thank everybody for joining again. Uh, hit me up on kwesiakan at gmail.com if you have any questions, further questions about this. And we look forward to connecting with all of you. Yerase.